Hello, hello everybody on today. I'm coming on today as part of a, just, um, <clears throat> I just decided to do this week, Monday to Friday, of um, videos for you guys for in this group around the topic of shame. And I'm gonna hit, just hit the nail on the head. I am call it shame, I call it, you know, I, because I find that so often, and even as a therapist, um, I, I and with being around the psychotherapy world for a long time, often we talk about things in a roundabout way and we don't nail it for what it is. And I, I do think that that reason, the reason for that is, um, there is a, an avoidance of shame in our culture. Although what we're seeing popping up all over the place inside us and outside of us is really based in, um, is shame, based in shame or a feeling like I am not good enough how I am. I am not worthy enough exactly how I am. And so much of our culture and our um, economy has popped up that feeds on those beliefs. And so hopefully I'll break it down in little videos um, this week, just so you can start to identify for yourself if and how shame pops up and shows itself in very sneaky ways in our thinking, in our emotions, and then in our behaviors. It's easier to pinpoint things like anxiety, like fear, um, disappointment, but it's a little trickier to actually identify shame. But if the books of Brene Brown really hit home for you, then, um, then you're well on your way to already identifying this for yourself. So today, one of the biggest symptoms I find that um, pops up around shame is this fear of criticism and also having a very loud inner critic. So if you find yourself avoiding um, people or places or situations where you feel like you might be judged, then you might inquire as to whether underneath there, there is a fear of being criticized, a fear of being exposed, a, feel, a fear of somebody pointing out something that is you might perceive as a fault or um, a fear of getting some kind of negative feedback. And imagine what life would be like if you did not have that fear, if you didn't worry about it at all, if you really truly realized that other people are having a right to their opinions and you have no control over what other people think about you. Just notice what that feels like. And if that feels like, oh my gosh, complete freedom, then chances are you might be trapped by this by now. First of all, there's nothing wrong with you. This is a normal human response to being, be, being born as part of a tribe, part of a community. However, um, and it also keeps us in line so we don't misbehave and really hurt other people in drastic ways, right? It's important. But if you find that your fear of stepping up, of being yourself, of showing up authentically because you're afraid of being criticized, if you worry that that is keeping you far smaller than what, <clears throat> than what you are, if it feels contracted and kind of, um, yeah, fearful and small, then it's gonna be really important to move through the fear of criticism. So um, know first of all, that what happens in your nervous system, you will survive if you let it follow its complete stress response. Okay, so what I mean by that is that if you have a worry, um, Say someone criticizes you. Notice what your response is. Is it to fight back? Is it to um, just leave that relationship or leave that town, leave that job? Like, is it to completely flight? Or is it to freeze? 
or is it too fond? Is it too people please? And often what I find in, um, what I found in empaths is that it's, we have a very innate response sometimes to fawn or people please when we worry that someone doesn't like something that we've done or that we've said. So here is what I'm going to first of all suggest is that when you have that fear happening or that worry is to do nothing is to rather than move forward as we are inclined to do to make it better to appease or change ourselves for other people to, but to actually relax back and and don't respond so i had to go through this many times a quite a few years ago of Noticing when I wanted to move forward to make things better, to stop criticism or to um, make people think I was, um, that I, I would conform to what other people wanted. I had to notice when that was happening and actually just relax back and not do it. So when, and it can be incredibly uncomfortable because all those feelings of shame that I'm not good enough and that if I stand my ground and be who I am, it's not going to be um, accepted or liked, right? It can be a very deep shame. But if you feel it, know that that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. What it means is that when that deep feeling starts to rise, that if you can see it through and not try to make it better, that you're gonna actually be able to, to heal it because you'll complete that stress response. So, um, for example, I had a phone call with someone and I, and I could tell there was, um, there was some criticism there kind of underlying, you know, we're empaths, you, we know the passive aggressive, you know, underlying tone. And I noticed it and I didn't respond to that part of it. I kept focusing on the content of the conversation. So I didn't try to make this one better. And then we hung up and rather than going back and worry about whether I've been criticized or not, allow that feeling to rise in your body and don't do anything. And once you've been able to actually, well, when I say don't do anything, you might go for a walk, you might do things that really make yourself feel validated and good about yourself without catering to that next person, to that other person. And you might stay in that, give yourself, say, I'm gonna do this for an hour without people pleasing. And then perhaps I'm gonna just do this for a day without responding. And allow that reaction, that nervous system pattern to move through your body to know that you can survive criticism without having to change yourself, without compromising yourself. But your nervous system does really have to see the proof of that. Because um, it's one thing to tell yourself, don't worry about what other people think about you. Don't worry um, whether someone's criticizing. It's one thing to think about it. It's a whole other thing to allow yourself that reaction in your body and know that you will survive. So um, rather than moving forward, relax back. Relax back into yourself. Know that the world won't fall apart. And often, often, I have been very, very surprised about um, other people's reactions that, you know, it wasn't actually meant as a criticism or um, they stay in relationship or they don't. If they're used to you people pleasing, they, you know, they, they might not stay in relationship, but to let go control of that outcome, let go control. Because imagine if you're contracting around billions of other people on this planet and worried that they're going to think something badly about you. And um, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very, it's much smaller place to live than what you deserve, how you deserve to live. So I hope this is making sense to allow that nervous system response to, um, to move through without stopping it in its tracks. Because when we people please, or we cater to other people, or we um, try to be perfect, we are, we're moving forward in a contracted state that's not us, as opposed to relaxing back into who we are. 
So that was the first little bit of freedom, the first little freedom tip I want to give you today. So we have often, um, when we have picked up shame or been um, brought up, um, you know, with some shame in our family um, or being shamed for who we are as empaths, and before we can see, before we're adults and we're able to see that, hey, that's that person's opinion. It doesn't really, um, you know, it doesn't have to impact me. We, when we're younger, we develop this inside voice called the inner critic. Now, the inner critic is a little uh, voice or a conscience or, um, or a, maybe a big voice, a loud voice that will continually reprimand, um, um, insult, um, try to keep you on your toes, um, criticize you as a way to actually protect you. So because you have, if you have an inner critic, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, first of all, but it does mean that you really need to pay attention to what that voice is saying and whether it's based in reality. And I can tell you that if it feels harsh, if it has a harsh tone, if it's quite negative towards you, if it makes you feel small and afraid, it is not true, okay? It is not true. And it was developed as a way to protect you from what you were feeling and try to keep you in line in perhaps um, in a family that didn't validate who you are or in a workplace that had a narcissistic boss. Like all those ways the inner critic goes, whoa, you better smarten up here. You better pull up your socks. What you said there um, was not okay. Or, you know, what you, you better go and apologize for that. It, can you see the tone is always trying to keep you safe? Okay. but it's not helpful because you are safe and you're safe in who you are. So um, Michelle has a question. How do we know when the criticism for ourselves or others is validated? Is valid, sorry. Maybe we do have changes we need to make in ourselves. This is such a great question. And it goes back to what the tone of the voice is. So when you notice that voice, if it's harsh and critical and mean, that is your inner critic um, that's not helpful. But if it is, if it is more of an intuitive feeling, Michelle, like, hmm, you know what? Maybe there's some, maybe there is some truth to what that person's saying. Maybe there is some room for improvement here. Would that feel good to me? And if it feels good to think about that, not as a way to get them back or to, to have them be your friend. Um, but if it feels like, huh, that kind of lands in my body in a good way, then that is that might be valid. Um, and it's also how, you know, what the, um, yeah, if there is, you know, Byron Katie actually writes uh, uh, quite a bit about this, that, you know, if somebody says to you, you know, uh, you're being a real bitch right now. And um, if you stop for a moment and think, hmm, is that, is that true? Is that actually true? And if there's part of you that goes, yeah, you know what? You know what, Madeline, you were a little bit harsh there. You could probably, you know, soften up a little bit there. That feels good to me. But if my voice says, oh yeah, you are such a, mm -mm -mm, you know, like that name calling, that is criticizing yourself and that is not good feedback. So that is the difference between those two voices. One is soft and nurturing and, and can be quite firm, no question. Um, and But it feels okay, it feels good in your body. But the other one does not feel good and it makes you feel small and contracted and probably below five years old, okay? So that's always a good test. Now, the antidote for the inner critic, first of all, is to hear it, to know it, to say thank you, and I, you know, I know where you're coming from, but I am safe right now. I am safe right now. Um, and, you know, I often find um, that when we do this, like just pause without reacting, relax back and breathe, 
that you can start to distinguish between what is helpful and what is not helpful in the ways that we talk to ourselves. And I will tell you that nobody was ever criticized into being a better person. It just doesn't work. Nobody was ever reprimanded or beaten into being a better person. And the same won't work for you. The way that kids learn, the way that kids develop self-esteem, become better at what they do, is through a compassionate, nurturing voice. So start to strengthen the compassionate voice in yourself. We're not taught this, and we're certainly not given, given this by society, I'll tell you that much. In fact, society strengthens our inner critic, if you ask me. But start to put a name to another voice. And you can, you can give her a, a name if you want to kind of externalize it to begin with. But eventually, let it be your own voice talking to yourself. That, you know, if you feel like you've made a, a big boo-boo or a big mistake or a big blunder, to come back to our common humanity. And I, you know, my hands go to my heart when I, when I say this because I think it, it, well, it does help to remember you know, you can tell yourself, I'm, you know, I'm a human being. I, I don't get everything perfect. And I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. I'm trying the best that I can. I am enough in this moment. And my intentions were, you know, whatever they might have been. Um, but to bring in that self-compassion. And it does help to actually do a formal self-compassion practice. Um, that you can find either with Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, has some great self-compassion practices, to start bringing in self-compassion to yourself. That's how we blossom. You know, roses, they blossom with food and water and love and attention. And the same goes for us. And to really remember, you know, I'll, I'll share a little story. Um, I was a psychotherapist, I still am, uh, for many years. And I was in a smaller town um, at the time. And often, uh, because I ran a really busy, very confidential, private practice, which is difficult to do in a small town. And it never failed to amaze me that I would see people out in the community, very high profile, super successful people, and they would often come to me for counseling. And um, it really, and, and in their personal life, they struggled. They struggled with self-esteem. They struggled with worrying about what other people's, people felt about them. The, um, the crippling, crippling anxiety. And, um, and it, it just reminded me always that everybody you meet is fighting some kind of internal battle. Everybody. I haven't met a person who is a human being yet who is also not fighting some internal battle. You are not alone in this. I think every woman I have ever spoken to in the confidentiality of, um, of a counseling office um, hasn't had issues around self-esteem or uh, shame or um, having a, a loud inner critic. Um, so Geraldine says I froze. Michelle says I'm okay. So I'm Geraldine, I'm running. I'm wondering if your tech technology, oh, I know you're coming in all the way from Ireland. I wonder if something's up there. Um, so remember that all of us are, even when you scroll Facebook and you see that perfect person, even they are struggling. And the more that we can on this group open up and share our struggles, we find it's so powerful to know that you're not alone in this. And when you do find yourself highly anxious about something and you're really confused and beating yourself up, to reach out to, out to someone, speak it. When we speak shame, it loses its power. And so the perfect person that you see over there is not perfect. Well, I think everybody's perfect in their imperfections, but never think that somebody over there has got it together more than you. Everybody has their ups and they've got their real, their real, real downs. The more we can speak about it, the more we can come out and we don't have to hide in our shame and, um, 
you know, in our, in our own, um, uh, our own anxiety, I guess. So those are some, just some, some tips around inner critic, around dealing with that fear of criticism that you will, you will survive it. Um, and feeling it in your body is probably, if it's difficult for you, you are not alone. It can feel very painful, which is why we often run to a glass of wine or something that um, helps us to numb those feelings of shame. If you can make it through without uh, numbing yourself, one time, just one time, feel it, be with it, let it be there and come out the other side, you will already have proven to yourself that you can do it, okay? And then it gets easier and easier and easier and you will be surprised at the outcome because if you're keeping yourself small, you never know the outcome of putting yourself out there. And that reminds me, just before I wrap up, um, there was a book that came out by a woman called Bronnie Ware, um, who was a, a palliative care nurse. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it was called The Five Regrets of the Dying. And the very first um, regret that she found from working with people who were palliative for many, many years was that they regretted not living a life that was true to themselves and they regretted worrying so much about what other people thought of them. So A, you're not alone. B, uh, you can, you have the right to live your authentic life. You have the right to end relationships that are not good for you. You have the right to your feelings. You have the right to express yourself and to express your truth. And I know this is far easier said than done, but when you start practicing it, it will, it will get easier. So Geraldine, why do you still feel guilty after all these years? So if you're finding yourself in more pa in patterns that keep on repeating themselves, usually they are embedded in something far earlier right? So we have these patterns, then we beat ourselves up because we've got the patterns. But to sit with it without seeking relief, which is, you know, I know that sounds painful, but to sit with it and see where it comes from, where the guilt originated. See, it, it tells me sometimes that there's something embedded perhaps earlier that needs to be healed something you took on as a child that actually wasn't your fault. Shame tells us it's your fault. You know, it must be because of you or something you are doing. And that is a, I want to say below five, below age five belief. Before we knew that parents were not perfect, right? We take it on ourselves. And so now when things happen, when uh, somebody looks at you the wrong way or says something to you and you go into guilt or a freeze response, kind of shut down, confused, um, and you feel like you, you're bad, you've done something bad, to, that is a good moment to pause and breathe and do nothing other than feel what you feel and let it move through you. And to really, to not believe the stories that go along with shame and guilt. Okay, shame and guilt are felt in the body, but they also come along with stories. Because we, it's such a difficult feeling, we start to develop these stories like, it's my fault, I'm a bad person, I've done something wrong, um... <clears throat> They can't possibly like me. I'm not all those stories. Okay. Those are the stories of protection. Come back to what you are feeling and see the feeling through. And often when we're healing from earlier childhood wounds, it comes out in tears. And that's a great thing. When you get to the point where you're, you <clears throat> you know, you know that you're, these are healing tears, that is a really, um, a really nice release. Okay. So following your patterns through, fear of criticism, fear of judgment, notice how it shows up for you um, and um, 
know that the more that you kind of keep yourself small, that you will survive moving out of your comfort zone. You will survive. And in fact, you know, there's this saying, everything lies outside of, or your freedom lies outside of your comfort zone. I was, um, I would say, not that it's so much that your freedom lies outside of your comfort zone. The freedom lies in your discomfort. So I hope just let that land for a moment. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so Michelle, I can, I certainly can empathize with that. So if you were told as a child, there is something wrong with you, um, then yeah, that is going to become, if you're, a child and your parent is telling you this, why would you not believe it, right? As a child, why would you not? This is your parent. They're, they're responsible for looking after you and they're telling you something about who you are, okay? So I would counteract that with um, knowing that when you feel like, oh, there's something wrong with me, to change that to, I am feeling, and name, this emotion. I am feeling um, shame and I'm feeling it right here. Or I'm feeling guilty and I'm feeling it right here. And as we come more into our bodies and out of these stories, there's something wrong. What does that even mean? There's something wrong with you. Like, and, I, and, I, and I'm not asking you, I'm just, like when you say to someone, there's something wrong with you, what does that actually mean? It means like, I don't like that behavior pattern that you are showing in this moment because of the way that you are feeling inside your body. That's what I'm guessing it meant. But who has that kind of vocabulary, right? They don't like something that they're seeing because they don't like something about themselves. And if somebody's telling you there's something wrong with you, I want to tell you that there is so much right with you. There is so much right with you. And what is wrong is being um, reprimanded for some kind of feeling that you're having, right? And us as very deeply feeling people, we uh, may have often been told there's something wrong with you or, you know, why are you so emotional? Or, you know, why are you crying so much? Or, you know, get it together. All those things are shaming statements. And know that you are, there's nothing wrong with your true, authentic self. And I mean that with 100% certainty, everybody that's on this call today. How do we do that? We notice that story, we know it's about them, and we come back to how we are feeling. And healing through our emotions allows us to enter into our true, authentic self without all the stories that go along with that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So what I'm hearing, you know, telling me I wasn't as good as I was hiding from abuse because I was afraid he, uh, it would hurt, he would hurt my dad. So, so there's a lot of fear there. Uh, and you know, you guys have just really identified some direct connections, which means that you have an opportunity to heal this. I think you know the source of where this is coming from. And it's really clear because you can see this was coming from a parent who had all their own stuff uh, going on for them at that time. Now, um, and where we speak from is from our own perspective. So when you hear those voices say, telling you you're not, you're not, you're not good enough the way you are, um, there's something wrong with you. That that is an old voice, and that's an old you that's hearing that and feeling that. Yeah. So you know, another thing that you can do is to um, to really to to look at that and have this. This might be more of an advanced practice, depending on where you're at. To have compassion for the person that actually was hurting so much that they said that to a child. Right, that they said that to a child. They hurt people, hurt people. You know, whether it's physically or emotionally. There's hurt, shamed people, shame people. 
So having compassion for their shame, but at the same time, this is more, uh, again, an advanced practice to get to the point where you can actually just physically release and give back the shame to that person that you as an empath, as a highly sensitive soul, took on from them. And I can feel the weight just even as I say that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you can do is... Um, I'm just unfolding my legs here, is actually a breathing practice that really helps to embody this. Let's see where we are here. And what we do is we just inhale our arms up and they're up over my head. And if I'm standing up, I've got my knees slightly bent and I'm gonna give a big, big exhale and I'm gonna lower my arms down, um, fold forward in between my legs and let it out like this. So I gather it all up then <sighs> and then I let it go and do that three times and then hang just hang like a rag doll I'm trying to explain this with my with my voice hang like a rag doll in between your legs and let it just melt off with you off you do that like every single day every single day I'm giving this back I'm letting it go out of my body and feel it just letting it go out of your neck and shoulders. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if we're talking about abuse, um, you know, I always, of course, I'm going to recommend therapy, um, psychotherapy, and uh, because everybody, I think, deserves to overcome and heal from, from um, abuse. And, um, you know, and shame is, is, is part of that. And... So part of, you know, joining a, a group here um, and speaking it is really part of the healing as well. I just, yeah. So I hope that has been helpful in terms of noticing, not believing your inner critic, not reprimanding your inner critic, but saying, you know, thank you, you are no longer needed here. Starting a self-compassion practice. Um... And moving through that fear of being criticized. And uh, uh, <clears throat> this kind of tags on our, the video from yesterday, but everybody has a right to voice what they feel. Um, so people have a right to criticize you. And when you let go of that, when you let go of controlling or um, manipulating or people pleasing other people so they won't criticize you. When you let go with your arms and say, everybody has a right to criticize me, then you, can, then you won't have to spend time protecting yourself anymore. Of course we don't like it. Well, nobody wants to hear it, right? I would far rather get good feedback than bad feedback. But you know what? People have a right to give me bad feedback. I have a right to set boundaries on stuff that's nasty um, and stuff that's, <clears throat> you know, abusive. I have the right to set a boundary, but people have the right to criticize. And even as I say that, you know, um, it's a little bit scary, but for most people to, to say that, but it's also a huge amount of freedom. When you realize ultimately the billions of people in this world, we cannot have any control over what other people are saying or doing. I wish they would behave how I want them to, but apparently they don't, you know, and being able to let that go that I am who I am and it's more important to live a truly authentic life um, than it is to worry about being criticized. There are people that who are um, right out there in terms of uh, being popular and celebrities and they are massively criticized massively and they survive and they keep going so <clears throat> when you find yourself over there come back to here pause and rest relax back into who you are into the presence of who you are you do not have to overachieve you do not, and you do not have to overdo, overwork, people please. When you relax back into your breath and pause, you have the right to be as you are. Not when you make a million dollars, 
not when you achieve the next thing, but right now you have the right to be as you are. And I've chased enough, you know, goals to know that when you achieve it, that um, if you're looking for your self-esteem through that goal, you're going to keep looking for it. It won't be there. It won't be there. So letting yourself relax and rest in who you are right now is going to be the most important work of your life, of your life. So, uh, Geraldine, where can I get psychotherapy in these times? You're welcome, Michelle. Yeah. You know, Geraldine, it's going to really matter. It's going to matter on where you are. You can, um, online, there are, there's something called talk space. Um, it depends on, you know, how I think, you know, it, how much, um, you can afford. Um, psychotherapy is being done online. So look into your local resources or just um, start Googling and uh, seeing who's out there and who, who feels like a good fit. It's really, really worth doing. For me, the most important thing, no matter what you do out there, what you achieve, that is so small compared to who you are, who you are in your body, in your being right now. And anything that you can do to bring yourself back home to your true self is so much more powerful, so much more meaningful than anything you're going to be doing out there. And when we pause and rest in who we are, what we do out there becomes, um, uh, becomes so much more powerful, so much more effective because it's coming from the, it's coming from our presence as opposed to our striving and our perfectionism and trying to reach certain goals. You see that two different energies. I used to strive, strive, strive up the ladder um, until I got burned out myself and came back to a place where I truly realized I wasn't even, it's not who I am. And now you can be sure that when I show up for you guys, I am 100% in who I am right here, right now. Um, and that's going to reach more people. As usual, the uh, video went on a little bit longer, but that's okay. I could talk about this stuff forever. So I, I hope this has been helpful for all of you. And um, my real goal for 2021 for us is to move through the shame that keeps us small. The shame that prevents us from seeing the, the full light of who we are which is beyond magnificent, it truly is, and bring us back home to that true authentic self beyond what we've been told, beyond what the world has told us to be, but who we truly are. So lots of love to all of you. Thanks for joining and I'll be back on again with another fun aspect of shame. Take care everyone, bye.